Sisters and brothers, listen, discern, open your hearts, lift your voices, lend your hands. The living God, the living, moving Spirit of God has called us together in witness, in celebration, and in struggle. Good morning, my name is Mark Twilliger, pastor at Asbury United Methodist Church, and on behalf of the praise team and the tech team, we welcome you to this nine o'clock worship service. We also welcome you to the 11 o'clock worship service. The regular 11 o'clock service was canceled today due to the anticipated snow. So whichever time you're worshiping with us, welcome. Let us worship God.
comes from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. This is God speaking to Moses about who would succeed him as a prophet over Israel. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up a prophet for them, a prophet like you from among their own people. 
I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words of the prophet shall anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak that prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord.
Our gospel lesson comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsed him, and crying with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may recall, like I do, asking one of your parents who asked you to do something, why? Or to stop doing something, you might ask, why, as a child? And often, my parents, usually my mother, would say, because I said so, that's why, exerting some parental authority. There's a a great divisive line in our country, and a lot of it is based on who said what, who is listening to whom, who we choose to listen to, who we set as our authority, who we tune into as our news source, who our preference is for what we want to hear, whose version of truth we are willing to select. And we need today, just like in all times, to be able to know how, how to determine Who speaks for God? We need to be able to discern whether words coming forth from people are God's truth, God's partial truth, or no truth at all. So the issue in Deuteronomy is Moses' life is about to end, and God is discussing with Moses his successor. Moses was considered by Israel to be their first prophet. A prophet is a spokesperson for God. We kind of have in our mind it's somebody who predicts the future. That's not a prophet. A prophet speaks for God. It's more a forth teller rather than a foreteller. But think about Moses and his early experience with the Israelite people among whom he was a prophet. Did Moses at any point say, gee, I would love to be a prominent person in my community, so I'm going to seek power for myself? Absolutely not. Moses was living an isolated life He was tending his father-in-law's sheep when God spoke to him out of a burning bush. Reluctantly, after much arguing with God, I can't speak, are you sure you have the right person? God needed a liberator for the Israelite people. Moses was the one God called. There was a great crisis 
And in the midst of a great crisis, God called somebody to be a great prophet, a spokesperson for God. So how did that go when Moses went over back to Egypt and tried to win over the people who he was going to liberate? How did that work? They would have none of that. Are you kidding? Us try to follow you out into the desert? They'll chase us down and kill them. We're better off staying right here where we at least know what we're going to expect the next day. Of course, things didn't go much better when Moses tried to speak to Pharaoh. Pharaoh wasn't won over easily either. But God never told Moses that it was going to be easy to be a prophet for God. And there are times in the Bible where prophets and people claiming to be prophets are in conflict with each other. Their words don't match up. So prophets would often be hired by kings. They would be a court prophet. And if you're a court prophet, if you had to choose between speaking for God to the king or if it conflicts telling the king what the king wants to hear, what do you think a lot of the court prophets did? They told the king what the king wanted to hear. So the word of God is not always what leaders want to hear. The word of God is not always what we, as God's faithful, want to hear. Let's think about motive for speaking. So Moses spoke not as somebody who sought re-election, not somebody who sought to be in a position of power. He tried to get out of it. He wasn't looking for that. Moses' purpose was to live into what God called him to do as the liberator of the Israelite people. So his motive is not his own power, but his motive is the freedom of his own people. Jesus likewise. Jesus wasn't a power monger. He didn't seek his own power, but Jesus came to liberate us from slavery to sin and slavery to death. People recognized that Jesus had an unusual authority. It wasn't like the authority of the scribes and Pharisees who were teaching about how to observe every jot and tittle of the law, Jesus' teaching was life-giving. It infused breath and, and relief into the people. It's like, my gosh, this, guy, this guy's exactly what we've been longing for all our lives. Just listen to these words, life-giving words. And Jesus' words complemented his actions. Jesus healed an un a man of an unclean spirit, showing that he had authority over other forces, evil forces. So lest, lest we sort of interpret the way things are today with the way things are in the Bible, Jesus didn't have an encounter with an illness. He had an encounter with evil. He was casting evil spirits out of this man. Let's be clear about that. And if you were possessed by an evil spirit or more, you were considered ritually unclean. If you're ritually unclean, what are you? You're an outcast. You're made to live in isolation, isolated from the community. Is that healthy for a person? Absolutely not. It's not healthy for anybody. Imagine the angst of the people who had to cast out their own family member to say you're unclean. And there's this discomfort in them knowing their family member is out there 
living with unclean spirits in isolation. Jesus healed this man of unclean spirits, casting them out, thereby restoring this man to his family, to his community. Just like Moses was liberating the Israelite people, restoring them to be the community that God intended, not simply slaves. So it's about healthy relationships. Whatever is holy is healthy. So the lesson for us today is to think about the words, who's saying them, why are they saying them? It's incumbent upon us as Jesus' followers to discern and act decisively on the authority that God gives us as Jesus' followers. So let's start with listen. So we're talking about Moses and his successor, the words that people were, would hear. This is kind of a preliterate culture. Now, of course, we're a literate culture. So I would say, listen, read, right? Read about our history, right? We're, we're a generation with a short memory. Back in biblical times, people could tell you their ancestors back several generations. They just, like, that was important. That was part of who they were. Lots of people don't even know their grandparents' first names, let alone their great-grandparents. So what about our spiritual history? What do we know about God's redemptive acts among our ancestors? That's why we read the scriptures. So if you don't have a plan, a reading plan, you just might haphazardly pick the Bible up once in a while, get a reading plan. Do something on a disciplined, regular basis. You might actually read some words you don't want to read that make you feel uncomfortable. We're called to struggle together with our history, right? with God's holy history among us. So read, listen, read, and then discern. When we recognize that no one of us, no one of us fully knows, right? Can you imagine somebody claiming, well, I know. It's like, if, if you can recognize that nobody me, you, none of us fully know we're more likely to be loving toward other people. Father Richard Rohr pointed out that when the systems of the world are able to operate as denied and disguised evil, they soon become the spirits in the air that do immense damage, but are invisible and unaccountable. Therefore, evil manifested in corporate activities can result in big paychecks for a few and poverty for many. This could be war economies, it could be our penal system, it could be our banking system, it could be our pharmaceutical and medical system. All of them in and, in and of themselves are good and necessary. But when we idolize them and refuse to hold them accountable, they're likely to become demonic in some form. And normally we can't see until it's too late. Right? Remember the collapse of the banking and insurance industry and we had to bail out the auto companies? We didn't see it though it was too late. We didn't see the evil that was going on. We didn't see the injustice that was going on. So when we read God's word and listen to God's word, 
We need to discuss it and discern together what is the Spirit of the Lord telling us. That's why we have small groups. That's why you have friends. That's why you have brothers and sisters in the church to discern together. Next, speak. You have a voice. Speak. You might say, well, I'm not ordained. Moses wasn't ordained. You might say, I'm not seminary educated. Good. Moses wasn't seminary educated. Jesus wasn't seminary educated. You have a voice. You have a head. You have a heart. You are every bit as able as anybody to confront evil and to encourage what is good, whether it's in your own household or among your friends, or even in church. Where did this healing take place? Jesus casting the demons out of this man. It was in the synagogue. Folks, there's evil lurking right in our institutional churches. There's evil lurking in school board meetings, in town meetings, in state government, right? So, Speak, discern, speak, learn. Pennsylvania Council of Churches gives us the tools to communicate with our legislators about issues that are important to us in the church. Check it out, Pennsylvania Council of Churches website, and look up their advocacy and action alerts. And, and there's a lot that we could learn. At the national level, right, we, we have representatives and senators who work in D.C. That's our job as Jesus followers. I mean, if Moses was to speak to Pharaoh and say, let my people go, that was a political issue because people were being kept in bondage. They were liberated because of God speaking through Moses. Today, folks, we can't afford to retreat from the world around us. The world needs us. There's too much going on. Did you know that the United Methodist Church has a building right on Capitol Hill? It's called the United Methodist Building. You walk out the front, there's the U.S. Capitol right there. Why? because we are called to be salt and light. And if we can't have any impact on what's going on in Washington, D.C., and affect what's going on at the national level, who are we? What are we? Did you know that the United Methodist Church has a building right across from the United Nations in New York City? It's called the, it's called the Church Center for the United Nations. It's owned by our United Methodist women. Why? The United Methodist Church is a global church. We believe that what we do, how we act in Jesus' name, has global ramifications. God sent his son for who? Whosoever, the whole world, right? whosoever in the world to put their trust in him will not perish but receive eternal life. God's concern for people is cosmic. It's the whole world. We can't stay in our own little bubbles. That's not faith in Jesus Christ. That's, I don't even know what that is, but it's not what Jesus is calling us to. Early Methodists early Methodists in England before Methodism came across the Atlantic. Early Methodism was arising in a time when England was on the verge of a class revolt, much like what was happening, what, much like what happened with the French Revolution, right? There was a economic disparity where there were a few people growing richer and richer off the backs of increasingly poorer people who were miners or slaves. 
And Methodists recognize that God cares about the whole person. So their ministry started out where? In the fields, field preaching, among the, the mine workers, among the lowest wage earners in England. Eventually, they began to confront slavery. And shortly after John Wesley's death, one of his protégés, William Wilberforce, a member of Parliament, was able to successfully get Parliament to vote to abolish slavery before it was abolished in the United States. You know what the Methodists did to egg on that uh, abolition of slavery? The Cornish Methodists, that was one of the points of arrival for the sugar that was coming from the Caribbean, which was part of that triangular slave trade, the Methodists really sucked it up and they said, all right, we're gonna boycott sugar. Well, that means no more sugar in our tea, darn it. But they said there's a bigger cause, slavery. We need to get rid of slavery. If we can mess up the economy of that triangular trade, maybe people will listen. And do you know, to this day, Cornish Methodists still don't take sugar in their tea? Imagine that. Because they feel so good about what their ancestors accomplished in helping to abolish slavery. Moses was called to liberate the people from slavery, right? This is what early Methodists were doing in England. Also, John Wesley recognized the evil of the war industry. And there was an old foundry where symbolically he bought that old foundry and turned it into a chapel. Honoring Isaiah's words, they shall turn their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. The foundry chapel. Over in the New World, what were Methodists doing? Well, they were challenging labor laws, minimum wage laws. They were challenging laws that kept women and minorities from full status as citizens. That was what Methodists were doing. Why? Because God so loved the whole world. The whole world. That's why Methodists did it. They saw the big picture, and they acted on the big picture. They listened. They saw what was going on. They discerned. This is what God wants us to do. Now, they spoke truth to power, just like Moses did to Pharaoh, just like the early Methodists in England did to their governing powers just like we are called to do here. Act. Well, sometimes our actions feel like we're doing things that are just going to never end. So like if we're feeding people, clothing people, it's like, when is this going to end? Well, It might not ever end, but what's important in this is that we're serving people, meeting an immediate need, while at the same time thinking, what is causing this? So let's think about some of the things we do at Asbury. Right now, we have the shelter. We've had the shelter every night this week because of the weather. So we're housing the homeless. So we're providing hospitality. Joe Ola has been staying overnight on some nights because they need volunteers for that too. And so we're meeting an immediate need, but at the same time, we're asking ourselves, what are some of the causes of homelessness? And while we act, we're thinking. 
talking to people. Tell me your story. How did you become homeless? What, what can be done to prevent other people from becoming homeless? We have a men's closet. Every Wednesday it's open. We have some of you from the church are helping with that. Why are people in poverty? Why do they need clothes? Well, we're meeting an immediate need by opening the men's closet. But by the same token, in the back of our minds, we're thinking, why are people in poverty? And that's when we begin to address the evil that Jesus addressed when he cleansed that man of the evil spirit. As long as evil prevails, we're going to have this gulf among people. The smaller number of richer and richer haves and the growing masses of people who are living on a ridiculously low income. God cares about this. This is not a separate issue from our faith. If you think it is, that's not Christianity. That's not the gospel. That's not something that Jesus would recognize. Certainly not anything that Moses would have recognized. So people who speak for God look at the big picture. They address everything, everything. No stone unturned. Right? Asbury, you're really good at community dinners. Why are people hungry? Well, I don't quite have a handle on it, but I know people are hungry, so I'm serving food right now. I'm preparing food for the daily bread. All right? But while you're doing that, it's working on your mind. You're thinking about root causes, and that's good because that's. Once you start to understand and discern together causes of hunger, poverty, racial inequality, that's when we can begin to open our mouths and speak truth to power and start to make a difference, right? So think about this for a minute. If I start to see water come through the door, under the door of the MEY where we are. Well, my first instinct would be get a mop and mopping, but if it keeps coming, I'm going to say, maybe I should find out where that water's coming from and stop it upstream. Got to do both. You still have to mop, but you still have to stop the flow. And so it is with the things that we hear, discern, speak up about and act on, meeting immediate needs and going upstream and finding the cause and addressing those. Now, you're one person, I'm one person. No one of us can take on everything. We just can't do it. Right? You can't think about all these things. You can't focus on all these things. Focus. It's important to focus. You can't do nothing either. You can't everything, but you can't do nothing. Pick something. Focus on it. Build on it. Right? So if we're all doing that, imagine what we can accomplish together. Listen. Discern. Speak. Act. Who are you listening to? Who says so? Amen. So today is the last day of January. Next Sunday will be February 7th. We are planning to be back in worship. Please spread the word. We're planning to be back in worship with both the 9 o'clock service and the 11 o'clock service at Asbury. Particularly, make sure you tell people who might not be able to tune in to the streaming, the live streaming services. 
Let's be in prayer. God, our creator, God of love, God of power, you have created us in your image. You have worked your redemptive acts through our spiritual ancestors, and you call us today to work in lockstep with you as we seek to manifest the good news of the gospel right here where we live. Forgive us for our apathy, our lethargy. Forgive us for thinking that there's nothing we have to offer when you have given us everything. Thank you for the great gift of Asbury Church, its people, the spiritual gifts, its ministries, and the community. God, help us to see where we are to tap in. Help us to see with whom we are to be in discernment. God, as this winter storm approaches, we pray for safety for people. As COVID-19 continues to rage, we pray that people will not let their guards down, but will continue to be vigilant and respectful of other people. We pray for the efforts as the vaccinations are being rolled out. God, we pray for those many, many economically underdeveloped countries that have no plan for the vaccine. God, help those of us who live in privileged places to consider all people. God, help us to think about who we receive the gospel from. Help us to think about who we are passing the gospel along to. Help us to be faithful. We pray this in the name of Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. I invite you to pray with me the ecumenical text of our Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power. As you go forth, may you be discerning listeners. May your words and your actions be pleasing to God and loving toward all people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.